y cerramos ya eh, con otra profesora americana eh, recuperando una, aquella célebre pregunta que se hicieron eh, que se hizo Linda Nosling eh, en el año 1971 y que se ha recordado ahora sobre por qué no hay eh, eh, grandes artistas. Esa pregunta la recupera ahora Sila Foliot para hacer un repaso a, a 50 años de reflexiones sobre la creación femenina, eh, tratando de situarnos en el contexto actual y en ese, en ese transcurrir del tiempo para pensar precisamente en las mujeres artistas. El currículum de Sila Foliot yo creo que es lo suficientemente expresivo de sus preocupaciones en torno a la, a, a, a la creación femenina eh, y también bueno, pues su larga vinculación a la universidad y a la enseñanza yo creo que también es una ayuda importante a la hora de, de estas reflexiones con las cuales vamos a cerrar eh, pues las jornadas, estos dos días de jornada que hemos tenido. Una vez que la profesora Folio termine, haremos ya nuestra última eh, tanda final de preguntas o de reflexiones. Muchas gracias, Sila. Gracias. Para mí es un gran honor ser invitado a participar en esta conferencia. Y quisiera dar gracias a todos los responsables en el Museo del Prado y los traductores que creo que no han habido. <laughs> anyway. Linda Nochlin published Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? almost 50 years ago, hard to imagine, in 1971. Some of the points this deservedly famous scholar of French 19th century art raised pertain as well to the Renaissance period of Sofonisba and Lavinia. And some issues remain fully unexamined and unresolved. Admonishing against seeking to identify and argue for the inclusion of those women artists who deserve to be called great within the existing historical and critical frameworks, Nochlin instead queried the very terms that have come to define greatness, concluding that conditions affecting women's lives and training as well as the effect that art history, art criticism, the art market, and many museums have kept women at the margins. Some of my themes are going to bring back things that we've heard through the last couple of days, which I hope uh, everyone will pick up on. To reassess after 50 years the issue of greatness with regard to women, and adapting Nochlin's thesis for those artists active in the early modern period, the 15th through 17th centuries, I shall focus on how greatness was and is defined. It is too large a topic to bring in all relevant points, but one measure would be asking if or to what degree the selection of works that populate museums and art history books has changed. Another measure is the art market. The presumption being that how much people will pay indicates value in broader terms. And moreover, to what extent does the market affect the practice of art history? Still another measure is querying the definition of the artist and acknowledging the concept's very gendered nature. The relative values of different artistic genres, which we heard about earlier, is an additional area to probe. Another is acknowledging the purposes that we now combine, uh, that, that what we now combine within the category art served in different historic eras. To examine how Linda Nochlin came to address women artists and greatness, let's start with some background. She became well known because of the quality of her scholarship, her friendships with contemporary artists, and her emerging feminist perspective. 
How did she arrive at this line of inquiry? She attended and later taught at Vassar College, founded in 1861 to provide a university level education for women, separate sex university education, I believe non-existent in Europe. Vassar's mission was serious. Buildings resembled Oxford colleges and students learned in small classes taught by renowned scholars including Pilar de Medariaga, a name that might be familiar to some here. Guest lecturers enhanced the atmosphere. Betty Friedan introduced the premise of her groundbreaking book, La Mística de la Feminidad, just a few examples. In this photograph from 1959, we see Linda, who graduated in 1951 in philosophy, now age 28 and thus not much older than those she taught, leading a weekly discussion section that contemplated the lectures comprising the introductory course in art history. Had this picture been taken five or so years later, I might have been in it, for I was fortunate enough to have been her student, and you can imagine how popular she was with us as a role model. Now think back to all the changes precipitated by events in the late 1960s, which led people the world over to question authority. In the fall of 1969, as single-sex university education was being phased out, Linda posted a notice on her, offer, on her office door indicating the new seminar topic she would be offering, the image of woman in the 19th and 20th centuries. And you can read it, I hope, in both uh, English and Spanish versions. Prophetically, she set out the agenda for feminist inflected research that many of us pursued over the next two decades. Some of these themes or their variations can be applied to research in the Renaissance period. So she had uh, quite an ambitious list of themes as you can see here. And she acknowledges the fact that this is absolutely new territory and nobody has gone there yet, and it's going to require work also in history, sociology, psychology, literature, mon Dieu, right? Uh, all of these things that were going to be brought in. And then she teamed up with Anne Sutherland Harris to produce the exhibition we've just heard about, and I frankly can still remember the exhilaration I felt when walking into that very first room. You mean women could do these things? The bold new assertions of Linda's scholarship in that pioneering catalog led to her being cited personally as someone whose ideas and whose very personality merited a question on a French licence exam. Qui est Linda Nachlin, right? Uh, Linda joined others, becoming politically active she was probably a member of the Guerrilla Girls, the coincidence of guerrilla and guerrilla here. And uh, there was subject of an exhibition here in Madrid several years ago. And notice they've chosen a kind of Calipigia uh, nude female for this poster. They didn't hesitate to challenge the assumptions that drove what was included in museums and how women artists fared in the workplace. Here's a Spanish version. Trabajar sin la presión del éxito. Uh, you know, read, read through it yourselves and you'll catch the sarcastic tone here of the advantages of being a women artist. Um, whatever you do, your work's gonna be called feminine. Uh, you know, you won't have to be caught in a tenured job forever. You have, can have the freedom of four part-time jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
Today, perhaps, we see more interest in contemporary women artists in sales with marketing tactics attaching them to luxury brands and celebrity endorsements, like the uh, image there on the bottom. But then uh, uh, there was a big sale at Sotheby's too, of old masters and Victoria Beckham, Posh Spice, came to uh, grace that exhibition. Although it may seem like a similarly mindless appropriation, Maria Grazia Chiuri, <coughs> the first female creative, creative director of the House of Dior, featured Nochlin's clarion call purposefully in her initial collection. And it was not a one-off. She brought in Judy Chicago, another American artist, this year to design her show. And Judy Chicago admitted that this was one of the greatest creative challenges she'd ever had. But the museum picture has not been so rosy. Despite claims and proclamations, as historian Mary Wiesner put it, a feminist future has not come to pass. Returning to Nochlin's essay, what points help us ponder the question of greatness for artists from the time of Sophonisba and Lavinia? We know about the social norms that regulated women's lives at the time, but how have art history, art criticism, the market, and institutional practices affected theirs, production, and others, the, others' production and reception. <coughs> Excuse me. For many museum goers, the definition of the artist is predicated on a romantic understanding of the outsider, a driven and perhaps antisocial genius whose work derives from his own inspiration and expresses his own innermost feelings. Or, as Nochlin expressed the myth, art is the direct personal expression of individual emotional experience, a translation of personal life into visual terms. While that ideal might not even accurately describe contemporary artists, who have largely unacknowledged contingencies in their careers, it remains a consistent myth. And of course, it is impossible to fit 16th and 17th century women into it, for that was never the purpose of art in that era. A German scholar, Martin Warnke, wrote The Court Artist on the Ancestry of the Modern Artist in which he argued that this modern day notion of the artist depends upon his finally being free from what are portrayed as the constraints of court service. But he demonstrates this is more complicated than the myth suggests. The model insinuates that working for a boss impeded true artistic freedom. Court positions, however, he shows, while carrying some responsibilities, actually freed artists from other worries. In some places, moreover, structures like guilds or academies restricted training and production. So actually, many early modern painters looked for courtly appointments to give them more freedom in terms of a steady income and even a pension. Had artists like Michelangelo been free, how many works would he actually have completed? With the Pope looking over his shoulder, he completed the Sistine ceiling in four years' time. Since our two ladies worked in the era of patronage, we must place them in that structure and not view them as if they were working today. As we heard earlier, the institutionalization of categories is another factor that keeps Lavinia, Sophonisba, and others from being considered great. Hierarchies of artistic genres, we might cynically suggest that artists themselves, assisted by their scholarly friends, made up, served their own interests. 
allying themselves theoretically with literature, which placed epic poetry at the top of the list of genres, treatise writers gave what they viewed as its counterpart, history painting, the historia, the narrative, top billing, because it similarly expressed high ideals through heroic human actions. This required a good understanding of the human body, especially the male. The theoretical project to distinguish between artisan and artist sought, moreover, to link the fine arts with the liberal arts and acknowledge that artists required an intellect in addition to a skill. But if women were presumed not to possess that capacity, they could never be real artists. And they still are not in some quarters. A former president of Harvard asserted some years ago that women were innately not adapted to math and science, which created a justifiable stir. A key job for a court artist was portraiture. Portraiture occupies a less exalted position in those historical hierarchies, and many artists expressed their displeasure at having to produce portraits as they had to please a sitter. But since portraiture was also defined as requiring only the ability to replicate, theoretically, women might be suited to it. Court or aristocratic portraiture and in particular is subject to criticism or just lack of interest, often described in terms of the formulas artists had to follow. Velázquez provides a good example of this kind of criticism. Art historians typically commend his portraits of the royal family, but really save their praise for the less official portraits, seeing in them the more valued side of art, the attempts to express what a modern audience can recognize as immediacy and feelings. If court portraits appear formal, it is not for lack of talent, rather a matter of representing dignity, itself a challenge. What was valued by those who could pay in Sophonisba and Lavinia's time? Portraits that conform to a notion of decorum by artists who could render appropriate pose and details of costume. And they sometimes paid accordingly. Court painter Friedrich Damm at Heidelberg in 1609 received differential payments for portraits depending on how much of the body was painted. 20 guilders for a full length, 10 for a half, including hands, five for head and shoulders, plus a variable depending upon how much work was expended on clothing and decoration. Everyone in this period was judged by appearance, but for women, whether in person or as portrayed, outward appearance signaled inner vir virtue or honor. The stakes could not have been higher. The real creativity of aristocratic portraiture is insufficiently appreciated because such portraits are now judged to lack what modern audiences has have been taught to see in a Rembrandt, say, where viewers seek deep psychological meaning in his self-portraits where he may have simply been experimenting at left with light and focus, or on those of others playing dress up in his studio. Court portraits are seen to be contrived while we have learned to see others as more natural. Friedrika Jacobs wrote an important book about the language of art criticism as applied to early modern women artists. From her perusal of a range of texts from antiquity to the Renaissance, she concluded by an analysis of various critical terms, the best artistic style is always described in masculine terms. You are all probably familiar with what Michelangelo is supposed to have said to his friend Vittoria Colonna. When she praised Flemish painting as being particularly devout, 
he contrasted the boldness and vigor of Italian art negatively with the surfeit of details in northern painting, concluding that the latter appealed, quote, to the devout and to women, especially the very old and the very young, and to certain monks and nuns, and even to gentlemen who had no sense of true harmony. Many scholars have demonstrated how Renaissance Florence was a math culture where numbers mattered and true harmony, as Michelangelo and his contemporaries understood it, depended upon studying proportions based on ancient architecture and sculpture and the male body. So a Raphael Madonna would be worthy of praise while a Northern European example uh, was somehow less weak because it didn't have the geometry and the proportions. Taste, what one appreciates in art or in whatever else, is developed, not innate. We are acculturated into it by what we read, what we hear, what we see on display. Statements such as Michelangelo's, echoed by others, have been very influential. Jacobs noticed how words like ardito, furioso, virile, appear in positive stylistic descriptions, while arrendevole, tenero, feminile, gentile, are negative designations. And as Babette Bone just pointed out, diligenza, uh, was sort of somewhere in between uh, attention, diligence, care, painstaking, was applied primarily to females and carried mostly negative meanings. And on occasion, these descriptors were applied to style irrespective of the gender of the artists. Jacobs noted that Guido Reni was occasionally described his works as da donna, fiaminga, and senza forza, while his Bolognese contemporary, Elisabetta Serrani, received virile and grande. What Michelangelo failed to recognize and then excoriated here was actually an alternative style very much in demand, like the Lavinia Fontana here. For art was a business and devotional images uh, in the Counter-Reformation period, and portraits that displayed details were what many patrons and collectors sought. For all artists, training involved copying, but not as an end in itself. The idealized imitation of nature made possible by the artist's intellect was the goal. Typically, women artists are praised for their ability to copy others, full stop. Vasari, who is the fountainhead for much of this critical vocabulary, found a way to praise the Florentine nun painter Plautilla Nelli, noting that she had been able to copy drawings by her fellow Dominican, Fra Bartolomeo, who practiced the high Renaissance style he admired. But Vasari had to admit that her work graced the homes of gentilwomini throughout Florence, a, a key indication for him uh, of something positive. We've heard about how the 17th century writer Giovanni Baglione called Lavinia Fontana's Martyrdom of Saint Stephen, produced for the major Roman Basilica of San Paolo Fuori la Mura, but sadly destroyed by fire, uh, so that no other critic can assess his remarks as unsuccessful because she was unable to meet the challenges of a monumental multi-figural composition, which can only be produced by someone of gran ingenio. He then related that thus chastened, she retreated to what she was better suited to, portraits. Baldinucci had called her earlier Roman altarpiece in Santa Sabina, a miracle for having emerged from a woman's hand. Praise, yes, but qualified by an explanation that suggests this cannot be the norm for a woman. According to Jacobs, Sophonisba is exceptional, but in a different way, being the only woman artist for whom critics use language to describe her style that nearly mirrored that 
uh, used for men, as Babette pointed out. By comparison, Nicolas Poussin in 1627 received a prestigious commission for one of the altarpieces in St. Peter's on the left. But it was not well received, and I don't think he ever made any other altarpieces. But commentators didn't see this as negatively affecting Poussin. It simply provided an opportunity for him to develop the intellectually rich narrative easel paintings for which he is best known as they appealed to an educated patronage. Nochlin warned us not to fall into the trap of believing that if we look hard enough, there just have to be some women artists who match up to those great male artists endowed with genius. Although the archival research of many in this room has revealed a much greater number of women artists from the 16th and 17th centuries and more information about those of whom we were aware, a frustratingly low correlation remains between names gleamed from documents, poetry, and biography with artworks that can be attributed. But an exhibition held in Antwerp last year brought to light the career of an artist previously unknown to most. Significantly, the Fleming, Michelina Vautier, worked in multiple genres, even the prize narrative historia, including large-scale mythological subjects, this one collected by Habsburg Archduke Leopold Wilhelm, the cousin of Philip IV. As often happens, owners of some works in that exhibition later put them up for sale, hoping to capitalize on Vautier's new recognition. In her case, there was one huge commercial success, selling at over twice its high estimate, but another failure, portraits lagging in the art market unless they represent someone famous or at least uh, known or are by a truly well-known artist. Somewhat ironically, despite earlier academic hierarchies of categories that place narratives on top, with portraits and still lives lower down, the still life category today fetches the highest prices. Fede Galizia was a contemporary of Sofonisba and Lavinia. She worked in a number of different genres and has been included in group shows of early modern women artists as well as in shows of artists of both sexes. But it was the high price of almost two and a half million dollars realized at a recent sale of one of her still lives uh, that seems to have inspired Trento to consider her worthy of a one woman show. So this summer, uh, there will be a show of her in Trento. You know, we're going to, after long years of oblivion, blah, blah, blah. One of her magnificent still lives, one of which really sold at auction uh, in New York for more than $2 million. Hey, let's have a show. At this, uh, if the market is the key indicator of greatness, then most people would have to agree that Artemisia Gentileschi has achieved it by the prices her paintings now command in the sale room. Museums in Hartford and London have recently purchased her works, the latter for quite a high price. At the same time that it was acquiring this painting and planning an exhibition on Artemisia that will open later this spring, they launched a successful public campaign to raise the final two million pounds to save Orazio Gentileschi's finding of Moses, and there's another version of it right here in the Prado, uh, for the nation. The irony in the headline gives the daughter primacy in identifying who Orazio was, and Artemisia may in fact be more famous at the moment than her father. She seems to have achieved, therefore, fame, which Vasari claimed all women artists could do if they only applied themselves. Hey, how many women here have heard that one before, right? Uh, but I still hear many who question Artemisia's being worthy of the label great. 
Note also how the National Gallery had to shell out five times as much money to buy Orazio's piece. Of course, his is a, an historia, that highly valued narrative genre, and hers a portrait, although as a probable self-portrait, it surely generated more interest because of her personal fame than if it had been another subject. Now, if these are in sort of relative scale, I've made a kind of interesting but largely irrelevant comparison. While Orazio's piece cost a huge amount of money, per square centimeter, you could buy an Orazio for $329, but Artemisia is going to cost you $925. So perhaps there's a little bit of a victory there. Nicole Escobedo has studied the market for artists, including Sofonisba and Lavinia, in England. Sales records show that Sofonisba was known, especially by those who participated in the Grand Tour, and occasionally her works fetched high prices in the 18th century, but at other times not. I look forward to two panels at the upcoming meeting of the Renaissance Society of America that will deal with women artists and the early modern art market. What about art historical scholarship? Many scholars have, of both genders have produced groundbreaking scholarship on Renaissance and Baroque women artists, but are those artists taken more seriously when male scholars write about them? Do they become greater when, as we say in America, they are mansplained? Nochlin argued, and it has been a mainstay of the feminist critique of the discipline of art history, that white male subjectivity has been normalized as natural until relatively recently an unquestioned acceptance that this is simply the way things are. Linda challenged that mindset in her seminar syllabus from 1969, but the grand narrative of art history that some scholars and institutions fiercely protect still struggles with how to insert women into this pre-existing formula without changing its parameters. We've seen uh, a lot about how museums like the Uffizi and the Prado have done a lot by mounting exhibitions on women artists and the hope for a future of well-researched exhibits. Museums with the international status of the Prado have done a lot by mounting exhibitions like this one and the previous one on Clara Peters that result from research and are open to rethinking, whose choice of objects to display demonstrate that these two artists are more than one-trick ponies that is to say they can work in different genres, and who adapt to changing circumstances in their careers, whose installations pose interesting questions and make relevant comparisons, and that make it possible for the museum going public to see the range, and I'll say it, quality of works these artists produce. I hope to see everyone at the Uffizi exhibition on Giovanna Garzoni opening in six weeks that Sheila Barker has curated. And I hope that research centers will support more projects proposed by scholars wanting to work on women artists and issues regarding the gendered nature of art historical and art critical writing. Because we still have a long way to go, or somewhat of a way to go, to provide context for museum audiences encountering the work of Renaissance and Baroque artists for the first time, let me close by updating the Guerrilla Girls Manifesto that I hope appropriately honors Linda Nochlin with a list of the advantages of being a Renaissance woman artist. Oh, I'm sorry that kind of got a, a little squashed here, but I hope you can read it. Um, not having to be an apprentice, being able to work at home, not having to draw male new models, receiving gifts in exchange for your works instead of cash, having critics decide what kind of work suits you best.
letting a male relative manage your business, spending time with royalty, always having someone with you when you go out, and finally, having your father's coworkers hit on you. Thank you. <laughs> okay.